Okay, so hi everyone uh, to the second lecture, continuation of the Darcy's Law. Uh, I am releasing the record of the lecture uh, on YouTube so that you can watch it later as well. So that's the barcode, the QR code of the, of the channel. So yesterday, I start with actually uh, reviewing a few minutes about what we covered yesterday, and then we, uh, we continue with the uh, studies of today to finish this Darcy's Law uh, lecture. Uh, we, we have done uh, a few things. We have uh, developed concept of representative elementary volume to say we can, at this scale, we can represent density, viscosity, and also we can define uh, porous media properties like porosity and permeability, and especially the, the static parameters of the uh, porous materials were also discussed, the porosity and permeability about how we can define them, how can we measure them. And also we need to finish the course today to see how we can we model especially uh, permeability as well. So we, uh, I'm just going through the slides quickly to remind you that we have covered this, that we, uh, we see a lot of porous materials around us in real life and a study of uh, flow in porous media as such is extremely important for us for many different applications. Then we looked into different applications like hydro, uh, hydrocarbons, uh, energy storage, uh, geothermal and uh, and uh, the Delft subsurface formation. This is the, uh, how the geological reservoir below our campus look like. And this is how, if you, if you inject cold water to get heat from the other side, how that flow would, would develop. And then uh, we looked into different types of the rocks and how we can image them and, and characterize them. Then we started to study the flow in porous media and we set the scale. And we said we have a variety of scales to, to cover, and uh, it goes from very small scale all the way to the larger scale. We focus on the continuum scale. Uh, and then uh, next came the representative elementary volume concept and said that this is a window that is large enough to average fluctuations out and is a small enough to still be like a point. Uh, description of the property that we would like to address. So we did that and then we started to now do the characterization of porous media with the porosity concept of interconnected void volume, which is the effective porosity. And we said that the total porosity could be higher because some pores might be, for example, for example, I'm trying to find one put a possible one, maybe for example, this one is totally isolated and there is no way to reach it. And in this course, we said that porosity always mean, means uh, effective porosity. And this is the range of different porosities that we described also in the lecture one. And we started to say, what are the methods to measure? Optical direct methods, imbibition test, uh, mercury injection and gas law. Uh, using PV equals ZRT. So that's already been discussed in lecture one and I am not going to go through details there. And then we said that now the second parameter which is extremely important is permeability of the porous material, uh, which was actually initiated by the experiment of, of Darcy for the daily requirement of water for the city of Lyon in, in France. And this is the report he did and the experiment that he he set up, we did the setup also ourselves with this uh, test that I did. And we define also important parameters potential, which is the thermodynamic pressure plus rho GH and H is uh, level, the elevation uh, with respect to uh, reference level. And it can, the reference can be anywhere. If we say it this way, then we can define Z axis pointing upward and as such, we can give elevation to, to different locations. So here potential is uh, P plus rho G H1 because the elevation is H1. Here is H2 because elevation is H2. And then we said this is quite similar to what Darcy did. 
And Darcy said, well, the velocity, which is the average velocity and Darcy velocity is the total flux, volumetric flux, or yeah, total flux, uh, divided by the cross-section area. Uh, flow rate, I mean, total flow rate divided by cross-section area, and it would be proportional to the gradient of potential, phi1 minus phi2 over L. And this is, a, this is the difference between the potential at the top and bottom of the sample, and this is the length of your, uh, your sandbag, your porous material. Then Dante said, okay, let's, let's find out what is the coefficient, what's the multiplier here? And he said that, well, he actually only studied water. He didn't really try with different, you know, his experiment with all other fluids. So we are just extending a little bit what he did as well. One very important factor is related to the fluid property that flows, and that's the viscosity of it. If viscosity is very high, velocity would be smaller. So it goes to the denominator here and that's the fluid property, and then rock property would be permeability. It's how easy flow can happen inside the porous rock. So it would be permeability divided by porosity. And we also said that phi one minus phi two, phi one minus phi two divided by L can be written as minus phi two minus phi one over L, which then in a small length, would be, would in the limit of L goes to zero, this, this factor of minus phi two minus phi one over L would tend to be the gradient or d phi dz negative. There is a negative sign. So this is a kind of a slope of a function of potential, or if you write it for discrete point of one and two, then it will be phi two minus phi one divided by N and the negative sign comes as well. And other thing was the discussion about that this is the average, Darcy velocity is average velocity and a flow inside the pores are actually faster because some parts are clogged or, or blocking because of the grains. So water is flowing really faster, but when you define the average based on the entire cross-section area of your porous material, then you're gonna get a Darcy velocity, which is superficial velocity, is not really velocity of anything. If you're missing that part, please just go and visit uh, lecture one. Then now we are in the lecture of today, which is about permeability in a little bit more details. Uh, one way to measure the permeability was what we just did. I mean, experiments that you will do also in the lab as well. You're gonna have sand pack, and then you're gonna create your own porous material, and then you're gonna do experiment. With experiments, you're gonna find out what the permeability of your system is, or your uh, rock is. Uh, in this course, we do uh, sand packs, uh, not rocks. So uh, that's experiments. Uh, how about modeling? How about we, is there any way that we could come up with theory that would give us an indication of what that permeability K is? Uh, these are the experiments again that we did and we discussed a lot already in the class. I'm gonna just skip them all. And you have seen them all here. We have described the, uh, the, the permeability. I am now here in this slide to say, let's study permeability uh, by theory and use fluid mechanics see if we can estimate permeability of a given sandbag. And that would be really a useful study and very informative and very insightful. So that's, the, that's what we are, we are going to do now, okay? So is everything so far clear from the lecture one? Okay, yes. very good, okay, great. So I can then continue with, with, the, with the lecture two or lecture one part two. Now, this is all about permeability and how can we, by theory, get a good estimation of permeability? Which means, before we go that also, I need to remind you that if you are given a tilted sample, which is not really straight, again, the same law would hold. You just need to know uh, potential here. You need to know potential here. 
and the length, so it is phi one and phi two, would be again rho g h, the same. So change of the potential would be delta h, which is here, shown here. The length that you would use is this one. Length would be the length of the aligned sample, but potential difference would be vertical. So these are the things that in your handouts also are there, but this is something that you would know anyhow. So this is the gradient also operator that when you have K over mu phi one minus phi two over L that can be seen as minus the gradient of potential over Z. And this is what, what we just already, I just explained to you. So if this is, for example, a phi function over, for example, Z, that's the slope here is the gradient operator, is the slope of the curve of Z. You could write it also phi two minus phi one divided by N. So based on the uh, practical or the uh, question, you would understand what you should do. So that's not a problem at all. Okay, so let, let us study permeability. For that, we just, let's just revisit one thing, that Darcy's experiment was done in very low uh, Reynolds number, which means velocity was very, very small. I'm gonna uh, talk about what that Reynolds number really mean, means, but for now we just say that its inertial forces are very small. It's only about viscous forces that drives the flow. And, and causes resistance to flow. He also experimented only water, single phase water. He didn't try other fluids as well. His fluids were uh, all incompressible water. So compressibility wasn't really steady. Steady state was the case. There were no transient or dynamics happening or time dependency as well. And the fluid were attached to the grains at the boundary. So slip was zero, there was no slip. I'm gonna go through details of these items in this lecture. So don't worry if these are just itemized at this stage. Now I'd like to model permeability with theory, with physics and mathematics. And that's the power of, of science. That without going only to the lab, we can have a good estimation of what that uh, permeability could be. So I'd like to start by first describing a concept of Reynolds number. The first bullet in the slide that I showed before. Reynolds number is a non-dimensional number, which is the ratio as written down in here. It's the ratio of inertial forces, inertial forces where you have density and momentum there, inertial forces, divided by viscous forces. We have two acting forces in our system when the fluid flows. One is inertia, another is viscous. There are other forces, but Reynolds represents the ratio of these two. For porous material, where you have grain size diameters are DP, which is grain size diameter, grains, like sands, diameter of sands of my sample, for example. Density of my water, if water is flowing. Velocity of that fluid that is flowing. Porosity of my sample. And viscosity of my fluid. Viscosity goes to the denominator. Density times velocity goes to the nominator. So that's why it's the ratio between inertial forces where you have density times velocity divided by viscous forces, which is viscosity. The grain size D is there for the length scale and you have one minus porosity as well because you're working on porous media. Okay, now we define Reynolds like that. And this is based on this uh, phenomenal work of, of also the Irish uh, fluid dynamics scientist that we have, we, we know as, as Reynolds. Yeah? So the flow now can have different regimes, different uh, topologies, configurations. When Reynolds is a small, all the way to 10, it means that it is a small. 
When Reynolds is a small, it means denominator is significant and nominator is not extremely significant, which means inertial forces are not too important. Instead, viscous forces are very important. When Reynolds number goes beyond 10, goes to 100, 2000, 20,000, it means that the denominator, the inertial forces, are very significant compared to the denominator, which is viscous forces. Okay? Do I have everybody's attention? And some of you, one of you look like he is actually texting. I try to, to see, but I hope everybody is with me. So, this is extremely important to get the, the science of it. If, if you would see, for example, the, I am very sorry for this very bad example, because if, if you see smoke of the, uh, the smoke uh, is rising to the top, okay? At the beginning, you see very, very laminar flow, and then it becomes turbulent, and it becomes really, uh, uh, with a lot of dynamics, eddies, and, and vorticities, and so. At the beginning, you have a laminar flow regime, and that's exactly where the laminar system comes from. Laminar system and the slow systems are stable. When you go to turbulent flows, inertial forces are very dominant, and also the system becomes chaotic. Okay? We are with Darcy's law, and the subsurface flow focusing primarily on laminar flow, which means our Reynolds numbers are very, very small. In fact, not even going towards 10 or so. Do you have any estimation of what's the speed of uh, flow in the subsurface formations like oil and gas reservoirs or geothermal? What, what is the speed of the fluid that we are speaking about typically? Feed uh, day. One, one, once more. One feet uh, per day. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good estimation. One foot per day. That's a, that's the, the estimation of how the how the fluid and, and uh, would you know how fast the fluid happens under the ground. And this is really small, really small. And so we are primarily on that on that subject. But we need to know if we have situations, let's say close to fractures or close to wells or high flow regimes where Reynolds is not close to 10 any further, it's really getting higher than that, then we need to correct our formula and understand this one. Now let's go and do this analysis. To calculate this Reynolds number, I said this is the sand pack that you have. These are the grains that are, are packed together, forming you your porous medium. Reynolds number will be the grain size, average grain size like that, dp, and then you have others that I just explained to you. Now, let's start and see if we can model permeability. The first step to do that is to simplify the problem first, and then we go back and make it more complex. Any, any complex sand pack system like this, or like, like the one that I have plotted there, can be assumed as a simplification process, like this porous material here, as the bundle of straight tubes for the very first step of assumption. We can assume that this is like fluid of so many small, tiny tubes are all packed together, and they allow flow to happen through them like this blue graph that I'm showing here. These are grains. When you look from the top, these are the channels in which the fluid flow can happen, right? I can assume for now only assumption that these are tubes. These are tubes that go through the material for now. And this is the configuration of those bundle of tubes. And that's why the name bundle of tube is given to this theory. We assume the porous material is bundle collection 
of straight tubes that are very small tubes, capillary tubes. Now I want to do even one step further uh, simplification or conceptualization. I would like to look into one of the tubes. If I understand one of the tubes, then I can understand bundle of them. Let's assume, let's consider one tube like this, which has a length of L and there is flow happening through this tube. The flow is laminar, Reynolds is less than 10. We are having one dimensional flow, which means the variation of the velocity only happens across the cross section and it has this shape. This is the velocity distribution in my system. And it is plotted here too. It's plotted here too. The velocity distribution as a function of radius is also given here, which means if you're here and based on your radial coordinate, you can put your R here and find what is the velocity, which is parallel to Z direction. Nothing changes across the cross section. There is no change. It's a steady state flow and this Poisson look flow happens through this. We call it in fluid mechanics, fully developed flow, by the way, theory of boundary layer. The boundary layers have developed themselves. It's not at the entry. There is no kind of development of any viscous uh, forces propagation towards the uh, layers of this cross section. We have fully developed flow. And importantly, we assume that the fluid at the wall of this tube is attached to it, is a stick to it. We call that condition no slip condition at the wall. No slip condition means that the molecules of the liquid and the molecules of the solid wall get attached to each other and, and it forms the, that they will just stick together. And you see, if you put small r coordinate, capital R, what would be the VZ? Vz would be zero. zero. When r is zero, what would be the ve velocity? Maximum. Because it is r square minus, so it subtracts something. So maximum velocity happens at the center, which is expected as well. Let's find the average velocity across this channel, the average velocity not the variations of it, only the average. What would the average flow rate be? The average flow rate, Q, is integral, which is summation, of all velocities at each cross-section A. Which means if I have this velocity, At this cross section of my tube, I have velocity for my fluid. My fluid is going out, for example, here in this cross section. Area of this is the area. Velocity is V. V times the delta area is the flux or the flow rate at that donut, at that chamber. I need to do that for all of these cross sections and sum them all up to get the full, full flow rate, the total flow rate across this tube. And that's why we write mathematically integration from R0 to R, capital R, velocity times the delta area. Velocity is given to us by this formula already. Delta area is what? What is the area of this if it is at standing at point R? It's the perimeter, which is 2 pi R multiplied by the thickness. What's the thickness? What's the thickness of this? DR. 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 Fantastic. So that will be 2 pi R DR. 
I don't need you follow exactly the mathematics or remember for any exam or so. I like you uh, get the concept. What am I doing? I am going through all these cross sections, summing up the velocity times delta area and do that for the entire section from R0 to R. And here as well is shown. So I'm going to do these sort of flow rate calculations for the entire for the entire system from zero to R to capital R. If I do this calculation, I'll end up with this formula at the end. That's the total flow rate. That's the total flow rate. If I want to know the average velocity of water, what would I do? I need my Q to be divided by cross-section area, like what we did for Darcy's experiment, flow rate divided by cross-section area. What is the cross-section area of this tube of radius R? What is the cross-section area of a tube with cross-section area R? R? E R square. So exactly, pi R square. So that's exactly here. This is pi R square. So if I multi, if I divide my total flow rate with the cross section area, I get the velocity average of water in my system. So I say instead of this parabolic shape of of uh, velocity distribution, my water actually in average is flowing with this velocity. So I just did an averaging, nothing more. And the average velocity is given by this. Now, imagine I want to know the permeability of this single tube. If I have only one tube in my porous medium, what would be the permeability? I know that velocity is proportional to permeability divided by viscosity times potential or pressure gradient. So what remains as permeability here? R squared dividing eight. Exactly, excellent. It would be R squared divided by eight. That would be permeability of one tube. Now, if I have bundle of the tubes, what happens? If I have many tubes, so I have a cross section with many tubes of cross section capital R. My permeability would be the average cross section area of the velocity would be smaller than the velocity of, of one tube. Because velocity of one tube would be a lot faster, but I need to know the average, especially considering the, the solid part, then I calculate my porosity and I multiply it by my average velocity. So I get this to be the average Darcy velocity. Darcy velocity becomes minus phi R28 mu times dpdz. What would be the permeability of this bundle of tube then? You have the Darcy. Individual. You, you need Darcy velocity to be permeability divided by viscosity times the minus pressure gradient. What is the factor that remains here? I need someone who has not spoken so far. Um, is it the minus phi times r squared divided by a? That's uh, Salima. That's exactly correct. Only the minus sign was extra. Okay. We need minus for the Darcy's law. We need minus dpdz, right? Because it's the, the, the pressure gradient should be negative, so to give you positive velocity. So your permeability would be phi r square over eight. So if you have one tube only in your system, that would be r square over eight because porosity would be one because you have you have only one tube. If you have many of them with radius r, you would have phi times r square over eight to be your permeability. 
Now you may wonder, why did we do that? One tube, one tube, and my porous sand pack are very different. Well, first of all, if you know the average size of your tubes or your empty gap, which is corresponding to average size of maybe your grains, you would get for, with this formula, a first estimation of how your permeability should be. Imagine your radius in your, your average radius is one micrometer. That's very small, one micrometer. What would be the R square of one micrometer? If imagine radius is one micrometer, so diameter is two. Micrometer is 10 minus six. R square will be 10 minus 12. If porosity is 20% or let's say 80%, just to make it simple, it's that if R is one micrometer, you're gonna have R square will be 10 minus 12, right? That's exactly the Darcy dimension, that's the Darcy. So you're gonna have K and imagine porosity is 0.2, then your permeability would be 0.2 divided by eight Darcy. Yeah, so that has a value like 0.1 divided by four, so 0 0.025 something. So this gives, you, this gives you an estimate in no time about how permeability uh, should look like in this system. But we are not yet finished. This is the start of the business, okay? Now, remember for tubes, if you have one tube, you will have R squared over eight. If you have bundle of them, it will be five times R squared over eight. Now I need to continue and make the system look more complex like the sandbag. Now, we want to move forward. There is, of course, a fact that cross-section area of our bundle of tube is circular, but the reality, the cross-section areas are not perfectly circular. If I have grains like this, my cross-section areas are like these butterfly things, right? These diamond looking channels. The channels are like that, like butterfly or diamond or some like whatever you can call it. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> I like creative students very much. Even though that makes me worried if you're listening to the course or <laughs> playing with your friends there, but that's fine. I mean, if, if you're that, that sharp to, to, to get me this, that I, I am happy already. Absolutely. So this is exactly the delay shape that is, is different than cross-section area of circular tube. Now, hydraulics, hydraulic engineers have come up with a definition of hydraulic radius. For non-circular geometries, they define hydraulic radius to be the cross-section area of your tube, whatever geometry it has, maybe rectangular, diamond or whatever, divided by the perimeter, the perimeter that gets wet with this flow. So if you have a channel like this, this is the channel of water conduction, water trans, you know, transportation. This is the cross section area that you see. Imagine this is delta X and this is delta Y. Your area will be delta X times delta Y. And your perimeter, would be two delta x plus two delta y. That's the perimeter. So they replace hydraulic radius with this r square, which means they say, what is the hydraulic radius of a circular tube? For a circular tube with the radius r, if you compute the area is pi r2. I am using small r by the way here, but it's, it, it means capital R, so it's the same. So that should be capital R. Divided by perimeter, which is 2 pi capital R. 
If you do that, that would be R half, not R. It would be half of R. And if you replace it with the same formula here, instead of R, you use R hydraulic, which is shown here. Since R hydraulic to the power two would be a quarter of R squared, then you will remain two out of eight here. That would be equal to minus five R, R normal R, not hydraulic, to the power two divided by eight mu dpdc, because R hydraulic is half of R. So permeability would be phi R squared over eight, or, or it would be phi r hydraulic square over two. The two are equal because right the hydraulic radius is half of the regular radius of cross section. Now with this extension, we can go and look into the reality of what is the hydraulic radius of spherical sand pack instead of assuming that the tubes are cross-section area or they have the cross-section area of circular shape, we can now look into the cross-section area that represents the sand pack better. With that, what we have done is to compute what the radius, hydraulic radius of sand pack will be. And the hydraulic radius of sand pack will be this. If you have grains, with size D, so balls of size like with diameter DP, which is particle diameter or grains, hydraulic radius is phi times DP over six times one minus phi. I could have obtained this formula for you in the class, but it's less about this type of uh, mathematics and more about the concept of flow. So if you have spherical balls that are sorted like this in your system, the empty gap between them that is open for flow to happen will have this hydraulic radius. When you calculate its area divided by perimeter, you find this. Now, what should I do? I should put this radius in this formula because that's my hydraulic radius of sand pack. And I will do that. When I do that, I will get what? My U will be what? Minus phi. Hydraulic radius to the power two, it will be phi to the power two, dp to the power two. Six to the power two is what? 36. Then you have two as well. So two times 36, which will be 72 mu, one minus phi to the power two, and then dp, dz, which can be written finally as u is minus phi cubic, dp square, 72 mu, one minus phi to dp, dz. And I can type it in the next slide for you, which would be this precisely. If u is one over 72 mu and stuff, then permeability, as you all know, is what Darcy says, minus k over mu, gradient of pressure or potential if you have gravity is, is your permeability. So permeability k will be will be this factor here, will be this factor, because that's divided by viscosity here times the minus pressure gradient. So with the simplest possible analysis of single tube and defining radius of hydraulic, finding hydraulic radius of grains, sand packs, using that, we have found a nice formula that says permeability is average size of the particle, the grains to the power two divided by 72 times the porosity cubic divided by one minus porosity square. And you may wonder 
well, how accurate that is, Adi? Because we did all by pen and paper. With experimental analysis that Carmen and Kuzeni did, extensive studies that they did, they found that in reality, instead of the factor 72, the experimental results say that you should use 150 or 180 in that range. So instead of 72, we are speaking about 150, 480. So they found the same proportionalities are correct. Only your assumption of your finding of 72 is half correct. It should be about twice bigger, 150 or 180. Then naturally, you would wonder, wow, first of all, you would be impressed that all these functionalities are right. And you were just wrong by a factor multiplier of this 72. And it should be between 150 or you can use 180. And what do you think the reason behind this mismatch factor would be? Isn't isn't it because uh, we only looked at one layer of grains at the moment? No, it could be it could be the same multiple layers of grains, but if they repeat themselves and they form regular straight tube. It, it, I think it is because the, there's a no slip boundary condition on no, the. Well, no, a slip can still if uh, the, the experiments that they performed were all also following a slip condition as well. Because of the continuity of the tubes? What do you mean exactly? Like not all the tubes um, are straight lines and go from the, the top to the, yeah. Very nice, Elara. It's about, about the fact that the tubes, although they are like butterfly or diamond, they are twisted. They are not a straight in the real porous rock. And they may just go this way, they may expand, they may contract, they, they are twisted. We call this phenomena tortuosity. Tortuosity is the fact that the path of fluid in porous materials is not really straight, it's intertwined. So that's beautiful to get the formula by pen and paper half correct with reality and the difference is only about tortuosity and the fact that the tubes are like a spaghetti instead of a straight flutes or, uh, or tubes. And see how powerful engineering practices and fluid mechanics is to give you a very accurate estimation of what happens in the nature. If you see the reality of flow dynamics in pores, you will see that the pathway to this phenomenon, a process is not a straight. They, they go through all different directions and invade the poor space of your rock. And I could see this picture forever until midnight, though I have had headache today because of teaching too much. But this is exactly what happens in micro channels. And starting from a single tube theory for laminar no slip condition fully developed bound layer theory, we reach to 50% accurate estimation of reality. This is the power of studying physics of geosystem. Especially important is that the functionality of dp square and this factor remains valid. So anyhow, this function now that you are, and then they checked, Kalman Kozini checked that the dp square, these things are valid. And so what I would like to, to mention is that if you write permeability to be dp square over 150 or 180, phi three divided by one minus phi to the power two, that's called the permeability coming from Kalman-Kuzeni formula. If you use 
particle. 72 instead, they say this is the permeability that comes from bundle of tube theory, because that was the base based on the tube theory. With 150 or 180 in the denominator, you will become kalman kozeni formula, which is empirical and so empirically uh, adjusted fact. So with that, we can say that we could really model this process. We assume that these are first very like a straight tubes, that this is happening. And then we corrected it for, for diamond shaped channels. And then we corrected it by empirical factor of 150 to 180. And that's really obtaining the permeability. We found the permeability. We know that permeability is proportional to the grain size to the power two. If you have bigger grains, like, like those, uh, 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 what is it, uh, river stones that you get and you put it in your garden or you see it in some river banks there, uh, they are uh, uh, big sands, right? Big, big stones. If you put them in a, in a tank, they will have a lot easier life to flow their fluids than let's say in my, in my sample of bundle of tea or the uh, sandbag. Same would hold for porosity as well. So in that case, let me just go through some stuff here and say whatever we have studied so far, we're about laminar flow, no slip condition, and Newtonian fluids. Newtonian fluids, I am not going to go to details of fluid mechanics, but the formula of VZ that I showed to you, the profile of velocity across the cross section that had that was here, the, form, the first formula here, this was obtained by assuming that you have Newtonian fluids. So it would be different if you have blood flow or you have paint flow or non-Newtonian fluids. But this is something that if you were curious, I can speak over coffee with you about what are those physics of non-Newtonian fluids. So in that case, I am done with the course main objective, what I'm going to do now from now to the end of the lecture is to, to question and debate over two main assumptions here. What happens if it is not laminar? What happens if Reynolds is not less than 10? What happens if you have slip? And these two would be the subject of my next couple of lectures after the break. I hope that was uh, convenient, comprehensive to you. Did you all follow this? Was it clear? Yeah. 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 Good, yes. good to hear. So I'm gonna pause the record and speak with you a little bit and then give you um, Okay, so let's continue. And I said that we are gonna question two main assumptions here, laminar flow and no slip condition to, to uh, make our understanding of Darcy's law and limitations of it uh, more comprehensive. Uh, so the first uh, case is laminar flow. Uh, what if Reynolds number is high enough for us to consider inertial forces? By the way, in subsurface formations, I really, I'm not in favor of turbulent modeling, okay? It's different than aircrafts flying and, uh, you know, uh, with the speed of really uh, eight, 900 kilometer per hour or something. It's, it's really, we are still in a slow uh, speed uh, um, regime. However, uh, however, uh, uh, the, uh, the inertial forces can become important and relevant. So what happens if Reynolds number is getting close to 10 or a little bit even beyond that? This Austrian hydraulic engineer, Philipp Forschheimer, he studied that case. And when you see in porous media, when you plot a scaled pressure drop delta P over L. With respect to your Reynolds number, you see that the Darcy's law is valid 
to a good extent up to the range of about 10. Now, what happens after 10 is that you start to enter transition, transient mode, and then finally end up with fully, fully turbulent flow or fully inertially driven, inertial force driven flow. So inertial forces can become relevant sometimes close to wells, uh, close to fractures if they are specially connected to wells. And so what do we do with that? Let's, let, let me just do that by pen because that's also better sometimes than the slides. We know from Darcy's law that U is equal K over viscosity delta phi over length. Instead of minus D phi D Z, I wrote delta phi over L just to make it more experimentally driven formula change of the potential over the length times k over mu. Let me write delta phi over L for you. Delta phi over L can be written so as mu over k times u. This is just changing k over mu, putting it in the other side. Okay, so this delta phi over L is now being related to the velocity with, the constant, with, with this factor, mu over k. What we see in the lab is that when you increase velocity, 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 the pressure drop delta phi that you would like to have across your sample to support this velocity, at some point starts to deviate from a linear curve. You need more or higher pressure gradient or potential gradient to support the flux that you would like to have. As if the resistance of your rock becomes higher to the flow. But it's the same rock, you have not damaged it. So that's exactly what Forshiner said, that when you go towards higher and higher Reynolds numbers, when inertial forces are important, you need to add rho u square also to this system. Potential drop would be more because there will be potential drop not only due to viscosity and permeability with velocity, but also to the rho u square to the inertial forces. They cause more pressure or potential drop. So you need higher pump uh, power to supply the same velocity when you go to higher speeds. Then he gave a correction for this beta and said, how would you do the beta? But the whole concept is this. Imagine you have the potential versus U. It used to be linear. And then suddenly for some velocities, you need if this was linear, you would need more potential drop over L to support that velocity. And the difference between linear and this reality that you observe in the lab is the justification coming from inertial forces. If you have inertial forces, your potential would drop more than if there is no inertial forces. Sorry, Hadi, uh, yes. could you describe what inertial forces are? It's, it's density times u square. Is uh, you you have mass like m. You know, inertial forces is that when 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 you exert force on me, I need to respond to it and accelerate, decelerate, right? F is equal m a based on second law of Newton, right? That's exactly the, the this this change of uh, dynamics that needs in me to take m and acceleration in order to respond to your force. So my density, which is mass divided by volume, would become relevant. U square as well. So it becomes like kinetic kin, you know, energy. It's the, the fact that my now my uh, momentum becomes important when I want to accelerate, decelerate, because I am in, the, in a zone that forces are not just small and my velocity is not really small, so I am 
I am going very laminarly, but now I have, I go accelerate myself, decelerate myself. So I have my mass, which is density, also important. And so velocity to the power two, which would represent my kinetic energy. Okay. So imagine I'm just walking and everybody is happily walking, but then now I, I accelerate, decelerate, accelerate, decelerate. Then my momentum would be important as well because due to the force that is exerting on me, MA would happen. And then I, I absorb an, uh, energy to as accelerate myself or, or uh, change my velocity as well, something like this. So it would be more to the, to the dynamics of, of, um, of the system that happens. And this is exactly what would accelerate you. This is a, a force, uh, inertial forces, that is uh, uh, representing the kinetic part of the entire energy. And the other one is more viscous. Viscous forces are those which stabilize the system. When you have only viscous dominated flow, a little bit of uh, uh, perturbation would, would damp itself, would not accelerate the system. So that would be that would be my uh, best explanation I can give you for now. That would uh, require your mass to be involved with your kinetic part of rho u two, which is like m v square. If you have seen the kinetic energy before, and when objects are falling, you need a kinetic and potential energy. This is exactly the the type of the drop of the energy due to this uh, forcing the particles to have. A higher speed than what you would expect in, in the only viscous dominated flow. I hope it, it is a little bit more clear now, if I haven't uh, made it more confusing to you. I don't know, is, is that now, do, do you have a little bit of sense about this m v square term? Yeah, but it's hard to visualize. Um, okay. what I'll try to see if for next uh, week, I could just visualize that for you to see exactly. This is, a, a, this represents the, um, the, uh, you see, there are two, two types of uh, forces. One is, is that coming from acceleration, and we know mass is defined by that. Mass is the coefficient that comes in front of uh, acceleration to give you force. So if you have an external force, you have mass times acceleration. And this mass, when you have energy exerted and you want to translate that energy into kinetic energy, your kinetic energy would be m v square or half of it. And this uh, represents the, the momentum and the energy that you, you will uh, carry with you because your mass now is important. Now, if you have denser fluids, it would be harder for it to accelerate with the same value. If you have, so if you have denser fluid, you would have more uh, potential drop. Maybe that would give you a little bit more physical intuition, which makes it that it, the other one is if you are more viscous, so honey instead of water, you would have more drop of the potential. Here, if you are denser, if you have a denser fluid, then it means that it will take a lot more uh, uh, force to accelerate it and have it to, to uh, have this kinetic energy. When heavier mass has higher velocity, then you have a lot of kinetic energy with it carried. And this law actually represents the kinetic, this part is kinetic energy. That would be important because that the speed is so fast that kinetic energy would be relevant here too. Okay. So this is Thank the you. other one. Yeah, dissipation of the energy is the viscous one. The other one is kinetic. So that this, 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 this has kinetic energy, which is corresponding to m by square, the velocity square times. That, that would cause, that would require a force or a potential drop, which is delta phi over L. Delta phi over L should also, part of it should be used in order to give kinetic energy to your particles. It cannot only compensate the viscous force drop, but also it should maintain the, the, these heavy bodies to carry that high speed as well. Okay, so that, that's, I hope overall it is now clear. Okay, I'll and try to another, see can, Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Another sorry. question, um, why do you ignore in the U equation the uh, rho GH part? Oh, that's the, inside the potential setting. Yeah, Fly. but before you only talked about pressure. Yes, right, when, when I, I have no gravity, then my, my tubes were horizontal. 
Then I oh, treasure. Okay. That's an excellent point, right? Okay. Uh, I, I spoke about the you know tubes like that, but in my mind, it went like that, but they were horizontal. If you have gravity, you would write potential instead of pressure for whatever we just said. So potential is pressure plus rho g z. And for that, z was constant in the studies before. Very okay, good. thank you. So kinetic energy is this, I hope it is more clear. I try to, to make it more graphic, hopefully, through the course. So these are the texts that are already uh, posted in the bright space. I just show it in here since it's being recorded, but the, the, the things are that the inertial forces are due to acceleration and deceleration of the fluid particles and not mainly because of turbulence. And this is because then you need kinetic energy. So there will be a part of the energy going through kinetic and that's why rho u squared would be relevant. And the rest already dis uh, were all discussed. And that's precisely the correction that Forsheimer uh, um, developed and presented. And this is what we call it as Forsheimer correction. And is the inertial parameter is this beta. And, and that beta is also given with this formula, which is a factor of about 1.75 or 1.8 is this B. And then I have one minus porosity up in here. And then I have phi a cubic with the grain size particle. That's the factor that uh, was for the kalman kuzeni if you remember. And now it's very analogous to the other one too. And with that, we know how to calculate the entire potential drop, which will be this part from kalman kuzeni viscous dominated. And if we go to higher speeds, then we put kinetic energy drop as well, or rho u square drop as well. That's one. The next, how about slip? What happens at what conditions fluids where do not stick to the wall? Uh, walls surfaces are always rough in nature. Fluids which are liquid, most of the time, if not always, they, they stick to it. They stick to the wall and they follow slip condition. No slip condition. Either. In laboratory, however, when we are testing permeability, sometimes we test the permeability with gas instead of water, instead of oil, instead of brine. Because gas flows better, faster, more convenient, right? And sometimes in the experiments, people were studying low pressure gas. So flowing low pressure gas through the porous rock and then they found something interesting. They found the permeability that they report is higher than the permeability of the same rock if they flow water through it. We know permeability is the rock absolute pr property. Permeability is rock property, it's not fluid property. So it shouldn't change if I flow water or gas, oil or honey or water or whatever. It shouldn't change, it's rock property. Rock decides how fluid can flow here. Why high pressure gas was similar to fluids, but when you make low pressure gas, then suddenly they found it passes faster, easier, more convenient. That was described by this effect of Klinkenberg. Klinkenberg effect is that gas flow in porous rocks, in porous media, if it, happening, it is happening in very low pressure values, the pressure is so low that gas molecule, molecular path or uh, yeah, the length scales that they can easily you know, uh, uh, have dynamics is corresponding to the size of your pore size Gas is not really obliged to stick to your wall. It can slip. Gas is not so condensed to stick like fluids, like liquids would do. It would slip. So then you would see that it goes faster because it's just like it doesn't really stick to the wall. And that's precisely that when you do gas in porous media at low pressure, no slip is no further a valid assumption because the gas at low pressure can slip. 
And that's when the free path of the molecules of the gas is larger or, or in the same order of the pore sizes. And that's really at low pressure values, by the way. And it's not typically something we would concern at the field scale studies and so. It's mainly relevant when we do experiments in the laboratory. In laboratory, sometimes we have very tight rocks. Then we put some low pressure gas because it can flow faster or something. And that may happen. And this is the correction to the gas permeability. Gas permeability should be corrected if we do calculations in the lab, the gas, the permeability you obtain with gas flow should be corrected based on the permeability you will find with liquid flow with this deviative term, B divided by pressure. If pressure is very high, the difference, difference between liquid and gas would be negligible. They would be reporting the same value. If pressure of the gas flow is very, very, very small. B is the Klinkenberg's factor here. Then you need to correct it. If you calculate the permeability with gas at low pressure in the lab, before you publish your paper, you need to correct it and report KL, not KG. KL is the permeability to liquid. And then you report that and say that's KL. And also, by the way, in the experiments, we found Kg, which is this much, and we have corrected it with Klinkenberg effect to make sure that it is consistent. Uh, if you would flow liquid, you would observe different permeability. So you would clarify the two. Which one you have measured? Are you reporting Kg or you're reporting Kl? And these are, of course, uh, uh, relevant. Also, this Klinkenberg factor is relevant to the mean free path the length of these uh, molecule of gas, how easy they can fly and so. And there are literature about it. It's not really about the course. It's more about, about letting you know that no slip condition holds in most of the cases. In some cases, low pressure gas can slip. And the last item of today's lecture, fractures. We studied flow of tubes and did uh, uh, understand that permeability for tubes was what was phi r square over eight. How about fractures? And uh, reality, rocks are a lot more complicated than sand packs, even and so. And we are gonna get through this step by step in this track until you become too expert that we would say, get your diploma and go away, please. So then. Uh, this is, uh, this is the reality that you see in, in real locks are really complex and you see a lot of channels happening here and you want to characterize them and our geology uh, uh, students are a lot more expert to characterize these, these properties. So we said about flow in porous rocks in the holes and in the micro channels. What about the flow across these sort of, these sort of uh, channel, uh, these, these uh, cracks? They are different than just uh, flow in porous media. What we do with them to characterize their permeability is that we assume that the flow inside them is like a flow inside parallel plates. And the flow would be like that again, similar to that tube flow, but it has different equations. And if we do that parallel flow analysis to these fractures and cracks, you will get that your flow rate is this is proportional to your potential drop divided by length. It has area and it has also viscosity in it. If you, if you have Q, what is Q? Is flow rate. Is velocity times cross-section area. What is the cross-section area of this fracture? What is the cross-section area of this? I'm not sure if you can see it that far. This is W. This is W. This is W. And the gap is H, is a small H. What's the cross-section then? Uh, 
Do you mean shape? W times H. W times H is the cross section. Now this Q is written as minus one over 12 mu H cubic W grad potential over L. W times H is area. So I am going to write it as minus one over 12 mu W H squared times W H times delta phi over L. This is area. What would be the permeability of the fracture then? Velocity is what? K over velocity is K or minus K over viscosity gradient potential. Or K over viscosity delta potential over L. What is K in this formula? What is K here? I need delta phi over L, which is here. I need K divided by viscosity. What is K? Uh, H squared divided by 12. Exactly. The gap square over 12. That's the fracture permeability if you do this analysis with fluid mechanics. For circular tubes, it was R square over eight times porosity. For fractures which are parallel plates, it will be H square over 12. There are also processes in porous media where you have reactive transport. You inject acids or other uh, things uh, to to create wormholes, to accelerate the injection properties, or sometimes it happens naturally, as in this rock. You see there are holes, wormholes, and, and stuff like that, and that are, are visible. And that is very close to simply what we studied. They are like, if you assume that this is like a tube, then its permeability, sorry, then its permeability will be very similar to what we just studied, and it will be phi, if phi is one, then it will be one, because that in that case, it is really one. Then it will be R squared over eight. Tube circular shapes are R squared over eight. Power plates are, are the gap, which is H or A or whatever you call it, square divided by 12. Okay, that's the probability you would use for fractures. So that's the final slide. This is the K for one tube for many of them in a, in a in a pack, you would write it phi times r square over x. And the fracture permeability would be h square over 12 because of the same analysis. Slip, no slip condition, laminar, and so on. So that ends the lecture today. I hope you learned overall from yesterday the concept of porosity permeability. How can we measure them? How can we model them? And the Darcy's law and how can we fix Darcy's law if Rangel's number is high? So kinetics or uh, inertial forces are important. And how can we correct it with slip condition if we are dealing with gas flow at a very uh, low pressure values? So until next lecture, I'd like to wish you all the very best. I'm going to answer your questions, but uh, at the, uh, I will first uh, pause the record.